What's going on, everybody? Welcome on in to the Sports Forums podcast, episode number one in the MLB world. This week, we are covering the NL West for all you Colorado people, California people, Arizona people. We got you guys covered. I'm here with Anthony Hirsch and Bryson Owens, myself, Riggs Tamburo. We're going to have some fun here, guys. Before we jump on in, just a really quick coverage of the 2023 season in the NL West. Obviously, Dodgers, D-backs, Padres, Giants, and Rockies. Dodgers won the division with 100 wins and 62 losses. Rockies rounding out the division in last place, 59 and 103 overall. What a brutal season there for them. Anthony, I want to come to you first, man. Any quick thoughts here on this division before we jump in, looking ahead for 2024 here? I mean, overall, man, this is the best division in baseball. This is going to be the most competitive play you're going to see consistently game in, game out. I know with the new MLB rules that every team has to play each other from every, you know, words, every American league team will play every national league team. That means there's going to be a little bit less divisional games, which is very much advantageous to every team, but the Dodgers in that mix. And this mm-hmm. is a team. If you look at the diamondbacks from last year, big reason why they were made to be so tough throughout the season is having to play in this division and routinely having to play against teams like the giants, like the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. That makes you, tough and there's going to be times in the season it's not going to go every team's way i mean even the dodgers i think if the dodgers were in any other division in baseball their win total would be more closer to like 115 even getting up to like some of these record numbers like the you know the yankees 98 team of that you know 114 115 getting up to the mariners even 117 up there but being in this division it's going to bring everyone record wise down a little bit but overall overall level of competition in this division is going to be the best in all of baseball. Mm. Bryson, I do want to ask you one thing, man, looking at the division here, because we're talking about the Dodgers. I know we're going to get into this, but the Dodgers, they might be on top in this division, man, but they continue to struggle and fall down and they don't get it done in the postseason. Actually got knocked out by their counterpart (laughs) here, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Looking at this Dodgers team, I know they made a lot of moves here in the offseason, so we can go ahead and jump on in here and take a quick look at them. But like I mentioned, they had they hit the 100 win mark last year. Mm-hmm. Very impressive for them. They now coming in. They are the big favorite. We'll go over their win total here in just a minute, but they are favored to win this division here once again. Your thoughts here on the L.A. Dodgers, all the different moves they're making in the pitching department, hitting department. How are you feeling about these guys? Yeah, you know, it was a – Typical L.A. Dodgers season last year, win a whole bunch of regular season games, look like the best team in baseball, fall short mm-hmm. in the postseason. The Dodgers kind of follow the same script, and I know we'll get to them eventually throughout this offseason, as Anthony's team, the Yankees, they win a lot of regular season games, they look like the best team in baseball, fall short in the playoffs. And then the Dodgers mm-hmm. followed it up with maybe the most L.A. Dodgers offseason someone could think of going out and spending a whole bunch of money on a guy like Shohei Otani, getting another Asian pitcher to bring him over with him with ya- Yamamoto um, with that thir- with that 12-year deal right after that. They even mm-hmm. went out and got Tyler Glasgow, an underrated move, really good player for them as well there, just to load up on what was already maybe the most talented team in baseball. Like there's, This follow the same script every year for the Dodgers, win a lot of games, fall short, best offseason in baseball, favorite to win the NL West the next season. So – I'm not at all surprised by what I've seen by the Dodgers. I want to touch on Yamamoto really quickly, and I want to bring Anthony in to talk about this one just a little bit more because I know Anthony has been incredibly high on this guy all offseason. He's been talking about him to me on camera, off camera, saying, hey, watch out, this kid's special. He just signed a record-long deal in the MLB, and you mentioned Shohei Otani there, Bryson, obviously coming in getting the most money in the MLB, so they did go deep in their pockets this offseason trying to stack up here. Anthony, any other information here, man, on the Japanese star Yamamoto heading into the season? Yeah, absolutely. So for Yamamoto, also with Otani, the Dodgers are implementing something. I know it's a lot. It's kind of this new idea for a lot of people, but this is actually something. If you think back to like Bobby Bonilla Day, every mm-hmm. year on June first, this dude gets paid a million dollars because of this mm-hmm. deferred contract. The Dodgers are very much bringing it back into style, and it allows them to immediately sign guys with massive contracts because you know you don't have to pay it immediately for the Otani deal. They don't have to pay anything of that seven hundred million until ten years after the sign after the signing date of that contract. Kind of a crazy trend there, but yeah, focusing on Yomamoto right there. 
This guy just inked the biggest deal ever for a pitcher, and he's not stepped Insane. foot on an MLB field. Just You haven't seen anything like this. None of us have seen anything like this before. But if you look at his numbers in the Nippon Professional League, uh, I mean, my apologies, the Nippon Professional League, the, ML, the MLB of Japan, highly touted, kind of well-regarded to be like the second best professional baseball league in the world. You look at his mm-hmm. record. 68 and 29 and posted a 1.84 ERA over multiple mm-hmm. seasons in Japan. Those numbers are just astounding, kind of unheard of. It's going to be interesting. There's a, some small differences between playing in Japan, especially for a pitcher. One of the big things that you will hear about are the seams of the baseball in Japan. They have these very much elevated seams. The seams are elevated a lot more than MLB balls, which means it's a lot easier to get spin like on your breaking ball, curve balls, it's a lot easier to grip the laces and you're going to be able to create more RPMs on your ball. One of the big things adjusting is having those lower laces and being able to, you know, be able to still get close in your RPM for some of your breaking pitches while also knowing they're just not going to move as much in Japan. Should be interesting to see how this guy adjusts to MLB hitters. The, the Dodgers did take a little bit of a risk there. I'm not going to lie. The fact that he hasn't yep. faced an MLB hitter yep ever in his career and it's going to be the first time you know opening day so should be interesting there but he was the number one free agent for pitchers in the offseason they went out and they got him anthony i think it's wild man to think about the fact that they really brought in a dude that's never been on a freaking diamond in the u.s with a completely different baseball and signed him to the longest guarantee in mlb history talk about a shot in the hey Denver Broncos just did something like that where you go ahead and bring a guy in mm-hmm. thinking he's going to be all that a bag of chips, and two years later, they're done with him. Hopefully, these guys don't get two, three years in and go, oh, my Lord, we might have made a mistake because that would be a very costly, long mistake they're going to have to pay out for a long time to be. So with that said, everything I've seen out of Yamamoto, dude looks phenomenal. I'm really excited to see how he does. Could be up for a, a Cy Young in his very first year in the MLB. So should be a lot of fun watching him. And honestly, I think having Otani on your team really takes a lot of pressure off of a young guy like that, signing a deal like that, because at the end of the day, even though you have the longest deal, you're still on a team with Otani and you're still an LA Dodger. So there's a lot of other factors that are going to be put to blame, even if this one kid's struggling a little bit. So But you'll look at the batting order that's projected against the right-handed pitchers for the Dodgers. You got uh, starting at the top, first batter up, Mookie Betts. Then you got Otani, Freddie Freeman, Will Smith, Max Muncy, Jason Hayward, likely Chris Taylor there in the seventh spot, James Outman, and Gavin Lux in that order. Looking at that lineup, man, and then you look at the left-handed pitching, same thing. Mookie Betts, Otani, Freeman, Will Smith, Hernandez, Muncy, Margot. Taylor, and then likely Gavin Lux there or Miguel Rojas in that nine spot. Anthony, when you look at this hitting order, would you say it's a top five, top six hitting order in the league? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the things that this team does really well is if you take a look at like the one through six, one through seven hitters, they're going to get on base at a crazy clip. They're going to work walks. Mm -hmm. They're going to get their base hits when they need it. I'm not going to come out here and say this is the best power hitting team because I think that that crown belongs to the Atlanta Braves down there when you have like four to five guys getting over 30 bombs a year. That's Mm -hmm. insane. Mm -hmm. But the Dodgers are right there. They're going to get on base. They're not going to strike out. Having such a big contact guy like Freddie Freeman at the top of your lineup, that's such a huge plus for your team because you know he's going to work. He's going to work at bats, you know, get to these 3 1, 3 2 counts. And he's either is going to work a walk or he's going to find a way to get on base. Moogie Betts, similar. I want to see him get back a little bit. I do think it was a little bit of a down year last year for Mookie, but we all know what he can do. He's also making that transition. We're so used to Mookie being an outfielder, being the center fielder. He is making that transition back to second base somewhere where he has played throughout his career. But, you know, kind of a new thing in the MLB for him to be solely playing in the infield. Yeah, I saw him a little bit when I was down in Arizona. It looks like he's adjusting pretty well from there. It's a tough thing, you know, to adjust from an outfield and everything down to your practices day in, day out looks so much different. Such a big change to make it as a Mm -hmm. ball player, especially when you're that deep in your career. It's not like Mookie's a rookie or one or two years in. This dude is an MLB bet. So huge shout out to him being able to make that change. I feel like that is reflective of how deep this team is. If you can tell Mookie Betts, one of the best players in baseball, that he has to change positions, that just shows you a little bit about the depth 
But at the same mm-hmm. time, you, you, you mentioned a couple of these guys like Walker Bueller, Chris Taylor, looking at the pitching staff, Walker Bueller, Dustin May. All of these guys in the offseason had to avoid arbitration with one-year deals. So th- there's a little bit of a window here for the Dodgers because all of those guys at the end of the season are going to be free agents. Hate to tell you, you can't keep all of them. Yes, I know they nope. have a really massive salary, mm-hmm. but at the same time, Dodgers can't pay everyone. So in my mind, there is a little bit of a window this season for the Dodgers. I think the one of the Dodgers interesting ended. things – Yeah, I was, was going to say one of the interesting things about this lineup that you kind of talked about, Anthony, is the fact that – they may not be the biggest power hitting lineup in baseball, but my God, you don't have a second to breathe against these guys. You know, we're going to talk about with a lot of these other lineups in this division. There's a few, there's a few holes in every one of these teams lineups where you're like, okay, we can get mm-hmm. a little bit of a break here. They're not so great in this spot. The The Dodgers batting order from top to bottom, you have no room to breathe. Every single one of these guys can get you for at least, you know, a dozen plus home runs. They're going to bat somewhere around mm-hmm. 300. Like they're going to get on base a ton. Like there's no there's no weakness in my opinion. Even when you talk about depth, you talk about a rigs, the ability for them to go from a right-handed pitching matchup to a left-handed pitching matchup almost completely smoothly. Like there's not a ton of changes, but they have those guys there that you can throw in to certain pe- matchups here and there. The fact that the Dodgers have all these kind of combinations for their lineup is so dangerous this season. It's really crazy when you look at it how stacked this lineup is, man. Especially just the big five. I mean. I don't care who you are. You're going to see a lot of teams that bring in pitchers just to try to get these guys, you know, you got to get rid of these four, you know, get these Mm -hmm. four out. We'll get you out of there. We'll get some. And I don't see that many relief pitchers being able to come in and just shut these guys down straight up. It's going to be very, very difficult. You're going to have to walk a couple guys. If you happen to walk a couple guys, the odds of someone else getting a hit is big. And they're probably going to be in that two, three, four run home run situation a lot against a very big batter and that's going to be tough for opposing teams so looking forward to that but I do want to jump in here guys before we jump on over to our next team on the board and ask you guys about the Los Angeles Dodgers win total for the Mm -hmm. year they have the highest win total in all of baseball with 103.5 to get this thing done I will go first here and I'll keep it very brief. I'm going to go under on the LA Dodgers win total here of 103.5. A hundred wins last year. It was very impressive. Even if they can pull out another two or three wins this year, man, I don't know. It's not that I don't think they're going to be a good team because I think they're definitely going to be in that 99, 101 type of range, but the D-backs are getting better. I think the Padres take a step up here. I think the Rockies, shockingly, take a small step up here. And I just think a couple of the games last year that were kind of gimmies aren't going to be there this year. And you got a much more motivated Arizona D-backs team. So I'm going to go under the 103.5. Anthony, how you feeling, man? I think I also have to be looking at that under for the same reasons that you said there, Riggs. This isn't so much about the Dodgers and the moves that they made over the offseason. This is about other teams like the Diamondbacks, like the Giants, like the Padres. In my Mm -hmm. mind, all three of those teams that I just said are going to be competitive in this division this year. I think the Giants take a step up. They've made some big moves in the offseason, and they're preparing themselves to be, you know, a two-type, three-type team throughout the majority of the season. And to give the Dodgers a good run for their money, the number one reason I can't do it, though, is the Diamondbacks. Like, I cannot wait for the series between these two teams uh, this season. I feel like this is going to be the true rivalry of the NL West. We're going to see some gritty games, might see some pitchers throwing at some guys. Like, it's going to be that type of series the entire way through. And I think just playing in those type of series are going to drive down your win total a little bit right there, just with the overall talent not just from the NL West, but from the NL as a whole, it's going to be very difficult for the Dodgers to reach that number. I really like the under here. Bryson, do you like the under, or are you thinking that they might be able to get above that total, maybe get somewhere around like 105, 106? So I'm actually, I'm going to go against you guys with this one. I like the over for this team here. It's part of what you talked about earlier, Anthony, with the fact that the MLB has changed it to, now you play everyone. So you don't play as many teams against the NL. You don't play as many games against your division. So they're avoiding some of these Mm -hmm. powerhouses in the NL con- conference as a whole, and they get to play more of these bottom feeders in the AL. They get to play some of these guys who are hoping for 70 wins this year where the Dodgers can just tee off on them, take two or th- all three games in the series at one point this season. So they're going to get more opportunities against teams they don't see very often who aren't going to be competing very highly in their conference. So there's going to be more opportunities for them to play lesser-known teams, avoid some of the big names in the NL, collect some of those wins, 
and then you know in their own division i think they're in a class of their own i know that the diamondbacks and the padres specifically in my opinion are going to try and compete with them i think that the i think they're going to collect wins against the giants and rockies so they've got built-in series is there where they can rack up the, that win total so it's tough because they won what was it 100 games last year and they mm-hmm. they felt like they left some games on the board they went out and got these big names i think 105 wins is pretty attainable for them there you go folks bryson gonna go over that 103 anthony and i gonna go under that 103 gonna be tough man gonna be fun but we gotta jump on over and look at the second best team in this division some might argue that they are not the second best team they just happen to get a little lucky last year those snakes over there in arizona the d-backs they finished 84 and 78 overall 0.519 overall in the percentage of wins they finished four and ten in the regular season 41 and 40 on the road and 43 and 38 win playing at home d-back cinderella story did come to an end there in the world series they almost got it done but they fell just short you take a look here and a few of the guys on the D-backs, man, that I feel are very promising when you look at the season coming up. You got rookie Corbin Carroll, won an award this offseason for Rookie of the Year in the NL. That's huge. Uh, and then you got pitchers like Zach Gallen, who was just short in the Cy Young voting. And a lot of other really good arms out here. You got Merrill Kelly on there. You got Brandon Fott, uh, who's actually one of my favorite young pitchers on the come up, who I think is going to have a very, very good year here. Probably going to be the number three pitcher for those Arizona Diamondbacks. So, Taking a look here, Anthony, at this team overall, man. Let's start with the very first easy question. Was what happened last year a fluke, or are the D-backs here and here to stay? Look, they're here and here to stay. There's no fluke that happens in the MLB postseason. With the amount of games that you have to play to get there, and also with the new wildcard format, like not only do you have to get to the first round, you have to win a three-game set in a wildcard round to get there in the first place, and that's what the Diamondbacks had to do. Just take a look at the number of games they had to play. That's not a fluke. You don't go on a month-long fluke, you know, the, oh, I don't know why we're winning. This is a reflective of the fact that they're building a good team over there in Arizona. And I think one of the biggest points, one of the things I've heard uh, former longtime A, Eric Burns, he was talking about this. It doesn't matter how you get there. You just got to get to the dance. And that's what they did mm-hmm. last year. The formula is going to be similar again this year. That being said, They do have to perform better in the regular season. They have to push that win total. I think they have to get it closer to 90-95. If you're going to be a wild card team, you have to contend with the Dodgers. But even if you don't, if you fall a little bit short, you want to be one of those top wild card teams to get a home series in the wild card round now where it's a three-game set. So home field advantage very much does matter. I just want to look a little bit at the moves that they made in the offseason This team Uh went out, man, and they solidified a lot of areas. You're adding to the outfield now with Corbin Carroll. You get Jock Peterson, and you get Randall Gritchick. Gritchick Mm -hmm. has been well-known to be one of the best defensive outfielders of the past five to seven years in the Major League Baseball. Jock Peterson is an explosive bat. He's also solid defensively. Really excited there. I think the biggest thing, though, if you look at this offseason that the Diamondbacks had to approve upon – was the pitching staff because that was the one thing outside of Gallon last year. It felt like the top end of the rotation was just looking a little thin, not the most consistent performances from there. But they go out and they acquire uh, acquire Rodriguez, Eduardo Rodriguez Uh from the Detroit Tigers. He is a hard-throwing lefty, probably going to slide into that number two spot. He adds a ton of depth and adds a massive left-handed arm to the top of that bullpen right there. Look out because the Diamondbacks are going to be scary and they're going to be right up there with the Dodgers. I'm telling you, right there at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So I I do want to push, man. Yeah, sorry. I I do want to push back on the there's no fluke in MLB postseason just because of personal (laughs) Uh experience. 2007 Rockies, kind of a fluke. Made the run towards the end of the regular season, wins the World Series, got swept, haven't been back since. So I just wanted to push back a little bit that there is no the no fluke in MLB postseason take. Yeah, with but that the said, fact right, is I want to defend Anthony is- here. Yeah, because Anthony, look, man, you're right. You look at what it takes to win in the post. This isn't the NFL, man. You don't get to just get lucky for a game or two and you're moving on to the next round. Like you got to beat somebody four times. I mean, you got to beat them. You got to stick it to them. And that's why I love the MLB, man, and the postseason. So, Bryson, I do agree with you a little bit. But I also agree with Anthony here, man, because I think that luck in the MLB 
and in the NHL is two things that I just don't really feel like in the postseason you can get lucky. And if you can, maybe it's one series, but you don't get lucky and find your way in the big in the big ship. There's just no way, man. It's not it's not so much luck that I think. I don't think that the Diamondbacks are a fluke. I'm with Anthony. I think that they're going to be up there. I think they're going to finish second in the division. This team is super, super deep all the way around. And one of the things I love about them is they were that Cinderella story that they talked about. But a lot of times with these like teams that are on the come up, they make a World Series run like the Diamondbacks did. They're filled with a bunch of one-year contract guys, veterans, guys who were there just to try and get a really good season of tape in. The Diamondbacks were built a little bit differently. They have a lot of young talent, a lot of guys grown from their system, a lot of guys who are going to be there for a long time, which is why mm-hmm. I like the Diamondbacks to repeat what they did. But I think it's not so much luck that I'm talking about when it comes to fluke postseason runs. Baseball, more than maybe any sport in the in the world, is a sport built on momentum. If you are a team that's just sure. rolling right now, all those hitters have confidence to hit off anyone in the MLB. Pitchers are rolling, and the Diamondbacks felt that. They captured that momentum. It was lightning in a bottle for them, and they rode it all the way to the World Series. That's the kind of – it's not so much a fluke or luck. It's just – be careful because momentum can die out going into a new season. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden that young and upcoming team that we were all excited about, maybe take a step back. Now that there's a whole off season, all those guys are brand new going into this one. You make some very, very valid points there, Mr. Bryson Owens. I can't argue with really anything you just said there. And momentum is huge, obviously, in the baseball world. But, Anthony, I want to jump over here, man. And before we get into the win total, I want to talk about the projected lineups. You mentioned Eduardo Rodriguez being added. I did actually mistake him. I believe they're going to have him at three, and they're going to have Fott at four. So their pitching starters in order looks like they're going to go Zach Gallen, their ace, Merrill Kelly, Eduardo Rodriguez, Brandon Fott, and Rin Nelson is likely going to take that fifth spot. Obviously, that fifth spot can kind of be interchangeable, you know, when, when arms get tired and everything like that. But that's their pitching order and then their hitting order. You're looking at Corbin Carroll, Cattell Marte, Christian Walker, Jock Peterson, Gabriel Moreno, Suarez, Thomas, Guriel, and Perdomo. Anthony, looking at this batting lineup, what do you rank them out of 10? Do you think they are a true threat to some of the bigger teams in the MLB? For sure. I would rank them right now. I'd probably put them at like a 7-5 out of 10. As you look at the top of the lineup right there, headed by Corbin Carroll, I mean, he had one of the most impressive rookie campaigns I've seen out of pretty much anyone, you know, in recent memory. Mm-hmm. Dude hit 285, knocked out 25 bombs. He's a huge plus to have as your leadoff hitter. He also reflects kind of this growing trend in the MLB. They actually put more of a power hitter at one because, yes, they're going to lead off the game, but you have to assume any other time they're going to come up for the rest of the game, there's going to be guys on base if you're going to be at that one spot right there. The one thing I think that stands out about this team is how well the bottom of the lineup was able to perform at points during the offseason. I mean, during the postseason last year, like there's certain points where you have your like Cattell Marte, you have Corbin Carroll, even Goriel is going a little bit cold. But you have some of these role players that are able to step in in some big situations. To me, that's going to be the biggest question mark to see if they're able to replicate that from this past season. But overall, this is a really good, really good offensive lineup. My one concern is going to be the strikeout totals for these guys because average-wise, it was a little Mm. down last year. I want to see it a little bit higher. I think they do swing and miss too much. They need to get the ball in play, have a better two-strike approach up there. If they're able to do that, though, they have a really good roster that can compete. Yeah, I think Bryson, I my... do want to ask you, man, about Zach Gallen. Do you think Zach Gallen is going to be a Cy Young guy here once again? I know he fell just short, but I think he truly has potential. I mean, okay, yeah, you got to deal with Yamamoto and Otani, but I really think he has potential to have the best numbers in all of the NL West. No, I, I'm a big Zach Gallen fan. I think that he is rightfully a Cy Young candidate pretty much year in and year out at this point in his career. The fact that he just racks up win totals for a pitcher is really impressive because – Wins as a starting pitcher, they're not the easiest things to come by because you could have a really good outing. You leave, all of a sudden your reliever gives up five runs and now your win's out the drain. He was able to keep teams within like one or two runs away from them make that um, the job for the bullpen really easy. And what I love about him, you know, you get a lot of these pitchers who they go like five innings. Go five innings, six innings, Mm -hmm. their night's done. They rack up a lot of pitches. Zach Gallen is very efficient with his pitches. He doesn't throw a lot of balls. He's very precise with where he throws and he goes deep into games he's every time i see him to watch him play he goes seven or eight innings leaving only Mm -hmm. one or two for the bullpen to clean up so i'm 
I'm a big Zach Gallon fan for sure. I will ride with Zach Gallon to the very freaking end, man. I love yep. this dude. I lost a few thousand dollars because he did not win the Cy Young. I almost got him, folks. I almost got him, and I fell just short. Uh, that, that was tough to watch. Blake freaking Snell take mm. that award away. We're going to talk about the Padres in just a second. As he deserved first, it. As he deserved it. Uh, okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but uh, looking here, man, at the win total for those Arizona Diamondbacks, they are once again – picked second in this division mm -hmm. to finish second. I should say, obviously last year they weren't picked to finish second, but they did finish second. And that's where they are projected here. Once again, Anthony, you look here, man, at the win total for the D backs, 83.5 looking at last season, obviously they had 84. So all they have to do is do exactly what they did last year and they're going to get it. Do you think they will? This is one of my favorite win totals to go over with out of any MLB team this year, because you can't tell me that you're bringing back. You didn't lose anyone. Like you're bringing back mm -hmm. everyone. It's the same squad you that you brought to the freaking chip last season. You brought them back. Not only did you bring them back, you made them better. You bring in two legitimate MLB vet outfielders that are going to make a direct impact from opening day all the way through October, you bring you add depth to the top of your rotation. You come back and in every facet of the game, you are better. And you're asking me, do you think you're going to get to the same win total as last year? Obviously, I do. I legitimately see this team. I think they could get to 90 wins if they're able to perform and be a little bit more consistent, not, not be as streaky as they were last regular season. I legitimately think this team could get to 90 wins. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of right there with wins. you. I don't know about 90 wins. I think 90 wins is pushing it because, like I said earlier, I think mm. the Dodgers are in a class of their own. I don't think anyone's going to really compete with the Dodgers for first in that division. I can see them being somewhere around an 87, 88 win team. They did improve a lot of positions. They got a little bit deeper, especially in their outfield, where it's not just Corbin Carroll having to carry that outfield. Now you've got guys like you mentioned, Anthony, Jock, and Randall Gritchick. Good outfielders, veteran guys who are going to be there all season for them. They improved on their pitching staff. They in, they did nothing but improve. So I don't see mm -hmm. and following the same logic I use with the Dodgers taking their over. They're going to get teams. They're going to in the AL. It's not going to be as competitive. They're they have to play against everyone. They get to avoid more games against the Dodgers. So they get to avoid more games against the top team in the division, which I think is going to help them out a lot. They're going to get better from the start. That's that's going to be the key, to, in my opinion. Is they're going to start better than what they did last year. They had to finish really strong to make that postseason run. So I mm -hmm. like the over for them as well. I'm not going to push it 90-plus wins like you, Anthony, but I do I do th see them clearing that 83.5. 84 wins, folks. Say less. I'm with Anthony here. I mean, I'm with Bryson here too, obviously. I don't have to, I don't need 90 wins, so I'm not going to say yeah. 90 wins. I'm going to say 85 wins. I'll go ahead and put that there and say 85, but really – we only need 84. And folks, I feel very, very comfortable that 84 is going to happen here. I mean, the big thing is people are like, well, they're not going to go on a run like they did last year. Folks, don't forget what they did in the postseason is not this number. This number is not that. So even though they turned up in the postseason, they still put up 84 in the regular season. I don't see with all the additions how they don't get to that number. You guys both made some great points here. So we are all actually going to go with 84 plus here for the Arizona Diamondbacks should be a lot of fun with them, but we got to jump on over here and talk about the team that finished in third place. And that is the San Diego Padres 82 and 80 overall 18 games back when they finished, they did finish though as the hottest regular season team, even though they fell short, they ended on an eight and two streak there in their last 10 games, 44 and 37 at home, struggled a bit on the road there, 38 and 43 overall. Obviously, we heard in the offseason they might be one of those teams taking a shot at an Otani or one of these big type of names. And it seems like they didn't really get what they wanted. And the thing with me about the Padres is I feel like these guys had so much promise, so many opportunities. They didn't really make any big moves. I don't really see how they're going to be that much of a better baseball team than they were last season. Anthony, you look at the rankings, man, one through five. I know we're going to do this in a little bit, but one, do you think the Padres can find themselves moving up from third place? And second of all, what's your biggest fear here with the Padres? I think they drop, actually. I think they're going to sneak behind the Giants and fall down to four right here. There's just a lot of mm -hmm. things that concern me about this team. 
I'm not even going to dig too deep in this. Just on the surface, you lose your best player in Juan Soto, and you lose mm-hmm. you lose your best pitcher coming off of Cy Young in Blake Snell. You're going to be a worse mm-hmm. team, like period. You're just going to be a worse team. I think Machado, you know, he's kind of the saving grace still there. He is still going to be a massive power bat that can get you to the you know 35. 40 bombs can be massive in the middle of your lineup in the heart of that lineup right there. But outside of that, they're going to need to figure some things out. The number one thing that scares me about this team is the fact that there was points at last season where the narrative about them was they're underperforming. They're underperforming. Like everyone thought where the Diamondbacks finished last year, that's where everyone saw the Padres being last year, but they underperformed and they didn't get there. But there was a couple points of the season where they got into these lulls, got into these slumps and a lot of times you'd look over to the dugout. These guys would be laughing. They would be kind of, you know, joking around, kind of messing around with mm-hmm. the teammates. Meanwhile, they're down eight to two in the sixth inning. That mentality really scares me. And I legitimately thought Bob Melvin wasn't going to be the manager there to start the year because mm-hmm. of some things like that. The fact that he's coming in, the team overall gets worse. I don't know, man. I'm very concerned about this team. And I see them finishing fourth. I'd see this being a tough year for the San Diego Padres. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, this is a scary one for Padres fans going into the season. A lot of what you said, Anthony, is just the fact that they lost so much talent. And not only did you did you lose them, because you can lose talented players as long as you do your due diligence and replace them with you know top level guys. They replaced Juan Soto with Jerickson Profar. That's not a that's not a good replacement. <laughs> Profar was no okay last year. He's not he's nowhere near Juan Soto. Mm. And they they didn't, not, not only did they not like bring back Blake Snell, Blake Snell's still a free agent. Like they, they aren't even like thinking about bringing him back this deep into the off season. Like they could bring back their Cy Young winner, and they're just not doing it for some reason. I think is wild. I, I think I'm very worried if I'm the Padres because not only are they losing some talent, they're so thin. They don't have a lot of room for error, especially with that batting order. They don't have a huge a huge amount of depth. Like the last two teams we talked about. The Diamondbacks and Dodgers, they have so much depth they can turn to. If this guy needs a night off, if this lineup isn't working, they have so many guys they can turn to. With the Padres, it's kind of what you see is what you get. There's not going to be a lot of variation with that lineup going into the season. So I'm I'm very worried. I don't know if I have them falling to fourth because I am worried about the Giants and the Rockies, obviously, and we'll get to mm-hmm. them in a little bit. I still think they have enough talent to finish third, but it's not going to be a competitive third in my, in my opinion. Hmm. Uh. Fair enough, man. Um, yeah, there's just so many question marks with this baseball team. I'm really trying to put together how I feel about these guys. Anthony, I think you have a point here putting them in that four spot, but I also kind of have that feeling of Bryson of like, I don't know, man, there's a, there's a couple other teams to be worried about here as well in this division. But I do want to talk, Anthony, about the pitching department for the Padres. You mentioned the loss of Snell. Obviously, that is massive for the Padres here. You look at who they got. I love me some Joe Musgrove, and he is their ace, but I don't know if he's the best ace in this division. I mean, I know he's not the best ace in this division. He's more of a number two type of guy on a lot of other teams here. Then you got you Darvish, who I can't figure out you Darvish. One minute, I love you Darvish, and the next minute, I'm like, dude, this dude is awful. Like He just gave up seven runs in two innings, three games in a row. Like Sometimes he's not a number two guy. Then you got Michael King, Pedro Avila, and Randy Vasquez. Anthony, looking at their number three here with Michael King, man, I'm not sure he's a strong number three. I mean, I would say depth-wise. I mean, you guys already mentioned depth. Obviously, we'll get into the hitting in just a second, man. But I think the pitching depth, it's just not there. I mean, are you worried about these guys? Riggs, I think you're. I think you might be looking at the best number three starter in the in the league right here with Michael King. This guy spent extensive years with the oh, Yankees. I don't know about that. The guy who went back to the pen, dude. This guy against some of the best hitters in the AL dominated year in year out. One of the most consistent pitchers I've ever seen. Like one of these guys that started as a reliever and got so good as a reliever that they made him into a starter. That's unheard of in Major League Baseball. It's always the other way around. You struggle as a starter, so then they're going to throw you in the pen for less work, a little bit limited innings. You never see it the other way around. That's how good Michael mm. King is. But I want to throw out one other name up there who I think is going to slide into this rotation and could even go up to two, maybe even take Musgrove to be the ace. 
And that's Yuki Matsui. He is a Japanese pitcher. They just signed him this offseason. With some of these bigger names like Yamamoto, like Otani, he kind of falls, you know, not getting the necessarily the same kind of spotlight some of these other guys are. He's legit. He is a really, really good pitcher. Put up phenomenal numbers in the Nippon League over there in Japan. This is a guy that's going to slide in. Not a whole. I think he's one of the most underrated pitchers heading into the season. Again, some of the similar concerns with Yamamoto. We haven't seen this guy pitch in the major leagues yet. But I do think that he's going to slide in. Also, they did pick up uh, Wandy Peralta, who's going to be a big lefty for him. So they did make some moves. But like you're saying, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think top of the rotation, when you lie so much on you, Darvish, the splitter, the splitter pitcher, where everything you do relies on if your splitter's working that day or not, that's scary to me. Anthony, hang on a second. Hang on a second. You just <laughs> called Michael King likely the best number three in all of baseball, potentially, right? You look at the guy's numbers last year. I'm not saying he's a bad pitcher, but he was 9-8 and eight overall, 3.69 ERA. Do I think he's good? I do think he's good. Do I think that he's as good as you are saying he is? I personally don't. Will I get proven wrong? Probably. And I won't be shocked when I do. Because you're right. I've seen the guy pitch. And when he's on, my God, he looks really, really good. But I think his consistency scares me a little bit. You talked about his consistency. I'm not really seeing um, as much of a promising guy that you're seeing there. But do I think he could jump a U Darvish and become the number two? I do. Mm -hmm. But that's more because I don't think they have the depth more than I think it's because Michael King is just so damn good at pitching baseballs. Sure. But Bryson, let's jump on over here, man, and look at this batting order really quickly because I want to ask you about yeah. this. You got Fernando Tatis on top here, Xander Bogarts, Jake Cronenworth, and Manny Machado, a very, very dangerous big four here. But then you got yep. Kim, Capusano, Profar, Merrill, and Azokar uh, filling out the rest of the order here. Outside of the big four, are you worried about this lineup if you're an opposing pitcher? Not really. Not really, honestly. Especially if you just look at what they did last season. After the big four, the best batting average is Camposano at 256 and with 81 mm -hmm. strikeouts to 30 walks. My biggest issue with the Padres is they are such a boom or bust lineup. And like we talked about with the Dodgers earlier. Sure, they may not lead the league in home runs, but they're going to have four or five guys batting above 300. And they're going to have mm -hmm. a bunch of guys with almost identical walk to strikeout ratio. Like they're not going to strike out a ton. The Diamondbacks, they may not have the most talented, the deepest depth in baseball, but they've got enough good guys where you're like, yeah, they can they can hang their hat on with anyone in this league. The Padres, mm -hmm. once you get past those first four, which, by the way, even the first four, their best batting average is 276. Like, they're not a very consistent lineup when it comes to that. There's going to be a lot of strikeouts. There's going to be a lot of guys who are going to struggle to hit above 250 this year. Could the Padres be up there with the league leaders in home runs? Sure. They've got the bats to do it, but they've also got the yeah. bats to lead the league in strikeouts and have one of the lowest batting averages in baseball. That's so true. that's that's my biggest concern with the Padres is when they're hot, they're one of the it's it's a tough lineup to go against because they've got guys who can hit home runs against anyone in baseball. But man, those streaks end, and when you're cold, it's a rough scene for this Padres lineup. And I'm so glad that you mentioned how hot and how cold they can be because last year, I think the Padres' biggest issue was. They lost so many one and run one and two run games because yep. they had one or no runs. I mean, like the if the yep. batting order's not on, they're screwed. And if the big four don't get on base, it's way too easy for these pitchers to get through these lines. You can walk a guy, hit a guy, whatever. And for like six batters, you ain't worried about shit. And that's a problem yep. if you're the opposing team or if you're the Padres. So overall, man, my biggest thing with this team is can they win the easy game? And can they win the close game? Because last year, that's what ate them alive. If they would have just got it done, what, three more times, they would have jumped the D-backs. But instead, now they're here all of a sudden in the offseason, like I mentioned, did not make the moves that I expected them to make. But let's take a look here, guys, at their win total, 82.5 on the season. I think it's a fair number when you look at the roster, you look at the schedule, their matchups, their tough road games. Okay, fine. 82.5 makes sense. With that, give me the under here. I'm happily going to fade the Padres. Anthony, are you with me on that one? Or are you going to take the over here? 
No, I'm right there with you. And I do not think this is a fair number to set their win total at. You're telling me they're one less game behind the Diamondbacks? No, that's just not that's not correct. That's not true at all. It's such a different okay. team. And one of the biggest things, you know, I think that's going to keep them below that is Xander Bogarts. I don't know if this guy can rebound. They ink him up to a massive contract, you know, before the 2023 season. The dude comes out and has the worst year by far he's ever had in the major leagues. It's really mm-hmm. tough to make that transition from the American League to the National League. Yes, I do think that he rebounds and he has a better year this year. He needs to prove to me that he can be the same Xander Bogarts in the National League that he was for the Red Sox in the American League. But, you know, you take everything, everything that we've been saying, I just don't see a way they even get to 80 wins. Bryson, do you think that they could go over here? Or do you think, are you right there with us where they're like, Eh, I don't know. I don't think they're going to be finishing above 500. No, I think they're going to struggle to finish above 500 this season. One of the biggest reasons you talk about who their best players are. You talk about the the more hyped up players like the Xander Bogarts. We also talk about the Fernando Tatis Jr., the Manny Machados. Mm -hmm. What do a lot of their best players have in common? Consistency issues is one. (laughs) Hype is one. But also injuries. Like they all suffered some major injuries last season. Fernando specifically, like Fernando Tatis goes a month without playing baseball because of injury. All of a sudden, now his consistency is thrown out the window. He's going to come back cold. And we just talked about how this team doesn't have the depth to really replace a Fernando Tatis Jr. for a month. So I think there's going to be stretches like that where one of their top players is going to be out. They have to fill holes where they can with some okay guys, and they're going to lose games because of it. So I think it's it's going to be a long season for the Padres, I think. So I think then we're all in agreement, man, that the under, Anthony, you mentioned the over for the D-backs maybe being one of your favorite bets. I think the under here has to be one of our favorite Mm. bets on the board as well, man, because like you said, I said 82.5 is fair, but I'm saying that because I'm on the under. Uh, And if it was like 79.5, I don't know if I'd like the under as much. I see them winning in that 78 to 80 range and they very well could be in that 76 range like you know like you're saying Anthony like maybe they won't even get close to getting there but you have to assume you look at this roster you look at how competitive this division is you got to think they at least give some of these other teams a run for their money push the upper 70s maybe the low 80s we will see what happens there with the San Diego Padres but guys let's jump on down here and look at a team that to me is the biggest wild card of every single team in this Mm -hmm. division. That is the San Francisco Giants. Obviously not a great year for them last year. They did fall short 79 and 83 overall did not reach that 80 mark. They really did not finish well, man. If you're just the, if the only team below you is the Colorado Rockies, you fucked up. Okay. You did something (laughs) wrong. I don't know what it was, but you screwed up overall, man. You see that their last 10 games, three and seven overall, they were good at home, 45 and 36. They were really bad on the road, 34 and 47 outside of the Rockies, the worst road record there. So Bryson taking a look here at the Giants, man. Mm. Once again, another team probably should have gone for Otani, probably should have gone for some more arms, probably should have added another batter, just like the Padres. And they didn't get it because the Dodgers love to take the fun away from everybody <laughs> else. Are you worried about the Giants here? I am. I think they're going to be somewhere around where the, I have the Padres going. I think it's going to be um, a long season for the San Francisco Giants. I think part of it mm-hmm. is not only did they not go out and get the big names, they didn't really go out and get anyone that changes life for them this season. I think they're going into more of a youth movement. They did go out. <laughs> I, the only player I think that I was impressed with that they got was pretty recently. I like Matt Chapman at third base. Yeah, He had a down year last year. I think he's still one of the better third basemen in baseball. But you look at the pitching staff, you look at their projected batting order, I'm just not threatened by a lot of what the Giants have, in my opinion. Uh I think that they're – I think they have a shot to finish above the Padres, but that's just more of how low I see the Padres being this season than how high I see the Giants finishing. I think there's a clear one and two. I think there's a pretty clear three and four in this division, and it's kind of going to flip-flop throughout the season. So I'm kind of – I feel the same way about the Giants in a lot of ways I feel about the Padres. Man, I, 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 there's a couple of things. I just, I think this Giants team is in a much different position than the Padres. I think it's exciting right now for the Giants, and I think they're poised to have a really good year. Look at their t- their top signing in the offseason. They went out and got the top bat in South in the South Korean League. They go get Young Ho Lee. This guy was the home run king of South Korea. They inked him up to a massive deal. They didn't get him cheap. It's a six year, $115 million deal. 
but playing with you know when you have the when you have the bay right there to the right field it's you only have to knock it about 330 and just get some air under it to begin some really consistent power numbers as a lefty playing in San Francisco over there. He's going to bring back for a team that led the league in home runs in 2021. They need to get more of these big bats, more of these home run caliber type bats back in the lineup. And that's exactly what they did. They went out and got him like Bryson mentioned, they go out and get Matt Chapman too, one of the best defensive third baseman in the league as he makes his return to Northern California I think his bat is a little bit slipped on. He's another big power bat they're going to be able to bring in. One of the other moves, though, they made a trade with the Mariners and got a former Cy Young, very recent Cy Young winner in Robbie Ray. He's going to join Logan Webb at the top of that rotation. Automatically, that rotation, hate to say it, but it is one of the best in the NL West. So just at the top right there, that was the one thing that did have him holding on All a right. lot right there. If you look at Logan, If you look at those two guys alone, Logan Webb and Robbie Ray, that's a really formidable top That's two, two guys pitchers. To it's two pitchers. And Robbie Ray's on the IL right now. He's not pitching right now because he's injured. Yeah, yeah but he's going to come back from that. When Robbie Ray comes back, this is a guy who's won in a Cy Young a lot more frequent than any guy on the Dodgers has. He like, got dice I last year. So, I, so I didn't say that I didn't like Robbie Ray last year, man. I, I didn't, whenever he pitched, I, I enjoyed fading Robbie Ray. He's a big name. He's a big name that gets a lot of that. Oh, Robbie Ray's on tonight. They're going to, and he, he just didn't show. He didn't show up. I think that's why he was traded. I think that's why he's a, an arm on this team. He's freaking hurt right now. Like Bryson said, like, there's a lot I got to see from Robbie Ray. Before you I you, you just can't, can't, you can't deny the fact that when he is on the mound and when he is healthy, Robbie Ray, stuff wise, is one of the best pitchers in the league. Like, if you look at the RPMs for his pitches, they're the best of all the you know, qualified <laughs> starters. You can say that about any pitcher. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, think, I don't think you can. That boy's I don't think on. you can look at another team <laughs> where they're going to get shit on for bringing in a guy who won the Cy Young two years ago. Like, I don't get That's that fair. at all. They made. They that. immediately solidified the top of that, that rotation. Compare that to the San Diego Padres. You have you Darvish at the top right there. Like, come on now. It's yeah. a better top of the rotation. My opinion, it's a better lineup. You got some big bats in there, bringing in some big bats and power hitters in there. I think it was perfect to what you said, Riggs, of the biggest wild card in the NL West. To me, this yeah. is a true number three team. True number three team. Look, I, I don't want to bang you for what you said, man. But one other thing you said uh, about Young Ho Lee, man. Yes, he is the number one guy in this hitting order. He is clearly the best hitter on this entire team. You look at his average, 0.288. The problem with this batting order is the only other guy even above a 2.5 is Estrada, man. This batting order sucks. And that's the only way to put it. To me, this is the worst batting order in baseball. I put them below the Rockies. No, I do no. not like this batting order whatsoever. I think one guy, that's great. Is he going to crack home runs? Yeah, he is. Is he going to get walked too often? Yeah, he is. Is he going to get hit so he backs up a little bit? Yeah, he is. And at the end of the day, if you le put it this way, if Lee goes down, they're fucked. That's it. That's okay, it. Right so they're done. So you think Who are they going to? They're going to put up two runs a game. It's a worse. You're saying it's a worse offensive lineup than the Tigers. It's a worse offensive lineup than no, the Reds. It's worse a than worse the Rockies. Offensive lineup than the Pirates. Nope. I'm talking NL West. I'm just saying I think it's the worst lineup in the NL West. Yes, you have. Is your one big guy better than like the Rockies' one big guy? Sure. But I would rather have a bunch of 2.5s, 2.6s across my thing than one dude that hits 288. And then I got guys with 0 .227, 0 .221, mm -hmm. 0 .228. They suck, Anthony. You could hit a .221, brother. So, I mean, okay, you couldn't. But you know what I'm saying? Either way, I just think that this lineup, it's weak. It doesn't scare me. I like Chapman. He's a very much a, 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 you know, a, a one-base hitter. He gets on first. He does his thing. Once in a while, he hits a double. But he's only hitting a .236 right now. I think his fielding is a lot more important than his hitting is. But his hitting better take a step up because they got to find – I mean – can Conforto's got to be better. Chapman's got to be better. Estrada's going to have to get to that two six two seven level and really give a give a good secondary to Lee there. Assuming Lee's going to get on pretty darn often, you got to think that someone's got to help here. So we don't have much time, man. Um, got to got to move on here from the from the batting order, pitching order. But stay tuned for that, guys. Definitely, like we said, a lot of question marks here for the San Francisco Giants. But let's take a look here at their win total for the season. They currently are sitting where the Padres are sitting mm. on the dot 82.5 here 
Once again, Bryson, I want to ask you first, man. 82.5, biggest wild card in the division. Do they get there? I don't think they do. I think they're going to sit somewhere around 79 or 80 wins. I think they're going to fall just short. I don't think they're going to be quite as bad as I had the Padres finishing, but I don't. It's going to be tough for them to compete all season. Like you were mentioning, Riggs, there are one or two guys going down from that batting order going to nothing. And if they go down for, if Lee goes down for a month, that's going to, the Giants are going to struggle. So I, Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a tough season for the Giants. Not quite as bad as the Padres. Yeah, you guys are crazy. They're going to be over. They are going to be over. You are all sleeping on the Giants. I will <laughs> die on this cross. The fact that the Giants are Whatever, going to Anthony. make they're, – they're going to shock you this season. They're going to shock you. I don't – like, if you look at the top of the I lineup alone, Jordan Hicks, one of the hardest throwers in the MLB. You have Ross Stripling coming in. They got him from a trade from the A's. One of like it is a lethal, lethal rotation up there. Very lethal. Ross Stripling is going to be bring, debuting his new pitch. He calls it the Death Ball. And it's worked really well in Northern California for whatever reason. Seems like with the fog up there, that little bit of humidity, that new pitch he's been working on is just deadly. Don't look out because this team is going to shock you. This team will shock you this season. All right, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, Logan Webb, 3.44 ERA. Jordan Hicks, 3.88. And then we got a bunch of guys in the fours, Anthony. So the batting order sucks. The pitching order sucks. I ain't convinced. Let's see when Robbie Ray gets back. Uh, but there's just so crazy. much here, man. Look, look crazy. I want the Giants to be good. I want them to be good. But if you go into the season, you already have injury issues. You already have a lineup issue. You already have pitching issues. It's gonna be a long freaking year come mid. But they, but they, the but they don't. They time. don't. They solidified all. Like they solidified every part of that. Like everything in the offseason that, that needed to be addressed, they addressed. The, you can't right, say well, the you same can thing. Start from the zero. You just can't. You get to start from zero, and you get to count every time they win. You got to count all the way to eighty-three, Anthony. They're not gonna get there. They're gonna fall short under eighty-two point five. Will they win more games than the Padres? I don't think their roster, honestly, is as good as the Padres, but sure, they might beat them. But either way, I have to go under 82.5 on both teams. But, folks, we got to get moving here. We got about eight minutes left in the show, and we got to get to the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> Obviously, Do we? we don't need as much time to talk about this team. They suck. They're the worst. Not a secret to anybody. Looking at them last year, like I mentioned earlier, 59 wins. 103 losses. They win 36% of the time. So I don't recommend putting your hard earned money on the Rockies here, man. Their road record, absolutely atrocious 22 and 59 overall. Mm -hmm. They actually are respectable at home. They won 37 games. They lost 44 games. Everybody knows course field. Not only is it a beautiful field, it's a tough place to play if you're on the road and the Rockies, for some reason, they play well there. The support is there when they're at home, and then they go on the road. They're like the Arizona freaking Coyotes, and they just forget how to play baseball, man. They're just not good on the road. So taking a look here at this team, obviously, you can say whatever you want about the Colorado Rockies, but they have a few good things. They added Cal Quantrill this uh, this offseason from the Guardians, who was one of our favorite guys last year. I mean, I think every time we saw Quantrill on, we usually went with the Guardians to get that done there. Then you got guys like Alex Gomber. You got ace Kyle Freeland, who was a little bit off last year. Didn't seem like it was the real Kyle. Hopefully he bounces back this year, gets it done. He is going to be that big dog likely heading in. I'd be surprised if they gave Quantrill the ace spot. So Anthony, looking at the pitching, looking at the Rockies overall, obviously we're here in Denver, Colorado. So we know a little bit more about this baseball team. How are we feeling? For sure. Um, I mean, right off the bat, I think getting Cal Quantrill was a really good move. You know, he's going to join Kyle Free with uh, Kyle Freeland and Alex Gomber when Gomber gets back from some of his injuries, you know, gets done with his rehab. He'll be right there. I think he's probably going to end up sliding in that number two pitcher role right there. And he mm-hmm. said, you know, I was looking at a couple of his interviews. Um, he, you know, he's been saying that He's been working with Freeland as soon as the, it was official that he was going to be coming to Colorado. He was actually the first person that they hit up, and they immediately started working into elevation, started working with his altitude, to figuring out how to pitch there. I really liked his mentality off the bat. He said he's ready for the challenge, and he knows that when you're pitching in Colorado, you know the pitcher that's looking across from you on the opposing team. They're pitching in the same exact conditions. So his mentality about it, willing to take the challenge, I'm excited, and I think he does pitch well here. Overall, though, pitching is always going to be the thing that's going to be so troublesome for the Rockies because you can't convince a pitcher to go have your numbers elevated if you go play in Colorado. 
I know it's always el- it's always altitude, altitude, elevation, elevation. But yes, it does make a difference, especially in the pitching game. It's just a tough thing to try to get top pitchers to come here. That being said, I do think that they have some young guys in the wings that could make a big difference this year. One guy who hasn't gotten the call up to major league camp, but he is in minor league camp. One guy that's widely anticipated to get the call up is Chase Dolander. He's the number two mm-hmm. prospect right now for the Rockies. And I do think this is a guy who is experienced pitching at elevation. Once he does come into the league, watch out because this is going to be a top starter, even if he is playing in Colorado. A lot of question marks there, man, but definitely some promising stuff. Bryce, you take a look here at the freaking pitching lineup. I just mentioned <laughs> numbers on the last time. Uh, talk about fives. Get your $5 footlongs out. The ace, mm-hmm. Kyle Freeland, 5.63 ERA. You look at the next four pitchers, 5.55, 5.54, 5.47, 5.49. My God, is that a, mm-hmm. I could score a run against this pitching lineup here. Mm-hmm. But – Outside of the pitching lineup, Bryson, I do want your thoughts on that. But looking at the projected batting lineup as well, you got old man Charlie Blackman going to be leading the team out there. Then you got Chris Bryant, Nolan Jones, Brendan Rodgers, Ryan McMahon, Elias Diaz, Bouchard, Tovar, and Doyle. I will say, I think at least the big six here are good batters. And like I mentioned against the Giants, man, you're looking at the worst batting order on this whole team is a 2 3 6 and the best is a 271, 269, mm-hmm. 279. So, Anthony, say whatever the hell you want, my brother. The Rockies <laughs> batting order is better than the San Francisco Giants. Bryson, really quick thoughts, man, overall on the pitching and hitting department. Yeah, there's one guy that you guys forgot to mention when it comes to the pitching. Our actual best pitcher is coming back this season, Herman Marquez. Missed all of last season pretty much with that elbow injury. He's coming back. He is the best pitcher in Coors Field. He has one of the lowest ERAs in Coors Field history. Pitches really well in California, too. Like, whenever he plays the Dodgers or the Giants, he pitches really well there, too. So it's exciting to have him back. There are some relievers I like with this team. Overall, the pitching, I wouldn't have too high of expectations for. It's the Rockies. We're Uh lucky to have an average pitching staff at best. But I'm really excited for the hitters for this team. I think this is going to be one – I'm really excited with what the Rockies are doing for once because they're actually going into a full like youth movement. They have their veterans with Charlie, with Chris Bryant, with Ryan McMahon. Like they have their couple of veterans sprinkled in there. We look at Tovar, he's like 22 years old. Nolan Jones, second year player. Rogers is still young. Doyle is second year player. They're bench. They have a lot of youth movement players in this one. I'm really excited to watch this season for the Rockies. I'm really excited for the batting order. Specifically, like you mentioned, Riggs, I think that top six is a very solid group there. It all yeah. depends on Chris Bryant's health. Chris Bryant hasn't been healthy since he signed with the Rockies. If he's healthy, if he's good to go, that fixes a lot of holes in that batting order for the Rockies. If guys like Tovar and Doyle can take the next step up into being consistent offensive threats down there at eight and nine in that lineup, that can help out a lot of things as well. Overall, I don't have huge expectations for the Rockies. I'm excited to watch the young guys play. I think the offense will still be pretty good. It's always going to be the pitching. That's going to be the biggest issue with this team. Are you looking over or under 59 and a half total wins? 59 last year. Do they get to 60? I'm probably going to go with the under largely because of how many young players they're going to bring in. You talked about Anthony. There's a young pitcher that they're expecting to bring up. They also really want to get Ryan Rollison, their first round pick from a couple of years ago in at some point as well. Uh You're going to see a bunch of rookie and second year players playing for the Rockies, which I think is going to equate to more losses than they're hoping. Okay. I'm going to go with the over here. I think the Rockies can get to 60. I think the pitching department got better in the off season. I think the guys that were here are going to be better. I like the hitting order. Ryan McMahon, my favorite player on the Rockies right now. I think he's going to be a huge leader for them on third base and in the hitting department as well. So give me the over here on uh, 59.5. Anthony, quick thoughts here, man, before I get your division winner. Absolutely, man. I think I have to go over two, and I think it's for the same reason that Bryson said. It's because of this youth movement. I'm looking at two guys who are immediately going to bolster the offense. Adele Almador, second baseman, shortstop. He is the best prospect overall right now for the Rockies. And Yanquel Fernandez, third of best mm. overall. Both those times, both those guys will be on the roster come opening day, but they're going to reach that over. I really, truly do believe it. 
All right, Anthony, really quick, man. Your uh, your division winner, Dodgers minus 450, D backs plus 800, Giants 12 to 1, Padres 12 to 1, and the Rockies at a beautiful tw- uh, plus 20,000. So we'll go ahead and ignore that. Who's your winner? I hate to say it. It's going to be the Do- it's going to be the Dodgers, but they're not going to finish going to the furthest. That's still going to be the Diamondbacks. But for the division winner, I think it's going to be the Dodgers. Bryson, are you on Dodgers? Yeah, I've got Dodgers. It's an ugly number, but I think they're the best team in the division. Fair enough, guys. I painfully uh, am going to go Dodgers as well, but I am going to put the D-backs there in second. If anyone's going to come close, it's going to be them. But, man, it's it's really tough here to say anybody except 103 wins is their win total for the year. Like, come <laughs> on, man. you got to give these guys the edge. But thank you guys so much for tuning in to our MLB podcast number one of the 2024 season this has been the NL West. Give those guys a follow. Bryson Owens at Bryson Owens 16. Myself at Rig Sports Talk and Anthony Owens or Anthony Hirsch at Anthony Hirsch 23. We'll see you guys next week.